this is embryonic in some way. Some of the things I'm going to mention, I'm actually happy to be delivering it here with this group because I think in conversation, we'll be able to flesh out uh, some interesting things. So I'm going to talk about the Middle East also, but sort of from a different tack, I'm going to back up a bit. Uh, I want to talk about Jewish Christian Alliance on and in the Middle East, but I want to take the conversation beyond just the geopolitical situation of today in 2016. Although I do a lot of work on Christian Zionism, I don't want to talk about Christian Zionism. Uh, I don't want to talk about the Iran deal or efforts uh, to repeal it or any other historically contingent initiative that seems ripe for Jewish Christian collaboration. Those things are, are really important to me and I think to most people in the room, but I think that in some way they're derivative or should be derivative of something deeper. I want to talk about something much bigger. I want to talk about the future of nothing less than Western civilization, or as I prefer to call it, Hebraic civilization, and, and I'll come back to that in a bit. I want to talk specifically about cultural alliance. I saw Jeff on your, uh, on your survey, one of the boxes you can check is cultural alliance, and that's the box that I'm going to check, just so you know. Uh, and by that, I mean a program by which traditional Jews and Christians can partner in a long-term spiritual and cultural project to revive and reinvigorate the West and talk about how that project can have deep ramifications for the Middle East and the people who live there. So I'll be accused of being overly ambitious and provocative, possibly impractical, and that's fine. But the way I see it, at least if, if Yoram's to believe last night in your remarks, this is the place to think big uh, and to lay out some vision. Uh, and after all, we're talking about Jews and Christians and Judaism and Christianity. These are big things in and of themselves. And I, and I think the conversation should be uh, relatively timeless. And I think really there should be a question mark at the end of the title of this conference, Christian Jewish Alliance, question mark. You know, the idea that there's something essential that connects our two communities beyond mere alignment of current interests is not necessarily intuitive. And I think that it needs to be explored. You know, are we talking about some sort of the enemy of my enemy is my friend alliance, or is this based on something deeper? So I'll just make a few points and we can we can talk. So the first point I'll make uh, is that civilizations matter and not just nations. Now, we're talking a lot about nationalism, uh, and of course, we're witnessing a surge of national feeling around the world. And I think many of us are, are pleased with it. We see it as a positive development. And we, you know, we watch with joy as peoples are snatching their traditional identities from the, the jaws of, of cosmopolitanism. But there's also a danger of embarking on a project of nationalism without considering a larger project of civilization. Of course, as some people mentioned this morning, there's a danger of elevating the nation uh, to an end in and of itself rather than a means. And as important as national identity is, and the affirmation of that identity as inherently moral, I would argue that in the long arc of history, civilizations matter much more than nations, and the nations are only good insofar as they advance a greater civilizational vision. And those visions, by my reading, are ultimately cultural. And more specifically, they are spiritual. They're rooted in some shared interpretation of the meaning of life and the cosmos. Now, we conservatives talk a lot about the West, Western civilization, saving the West, preserving the West. We're usually drawing comparisons, usually unfavorable with other civilizations, usually Islamic, but we don't actually talk a lot about what the West is and what we need to do to make the West better. Uh, my second point is that our civilization, Western civilization, is in trouble. Now, people will debate that. Some people say, actually, it's, it's much better than people say. People will look at different metrics to ascertain whether or not they are right in that debate. But I would say, and I think many people agree with me, that in some sense, the West is declining. Now, the states that comprise the West continue to assert military uh, and economic dominance around the world, and I think that's wonderful, and they probably will do so in the near future. But the West, if, if, if any of us here agree on anything, I would think it's probably this, that the West has suffered from some kind of wholesale gutting of its essential content. It's been, it's been hollowed out. What the West was is not what the West is today. And we've been reduced to these sort of bland calls for freedom, liberty, and democracy. And in a real sense, we've been alienated from our own origins. Now, we in the West, we're not lacking in any sort of material wealth or philosophical concepts or technique. In all of those categories, we are for sure the top dog. We're lacking precisely what made us great to begin with. We lack spirit. We lack spiritual energy. Uh, we've forgotten the principles and in some ways, more importantly, the narrative that made us great. Now, when I say spiritual or spirit, I don't necessarily mean 
religious, as in sort of a, a creed or a dogma. I mean sort of the, the geist. We've lost the stuff, the spiritual stuff, the transcendent stuff that made us the West. And if, and if, uh, rec and if the project is recovering that vision, which is what I argue it should be, that process must entail returning to the source, uh, the spiritual source of Western civilization. And what is it? I would say that while we benefit greatly from the classical tradition and its reinterpretation in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the true source of our spiritual power in the West is the Hebraic tradition, which is, I would say, that set of stories, ideas, and principles that flow from the Hebrew Bible. That is the answer to the question, what do Jews and Christians share? I've asked myself that quite a bit because of the work that I do at the Philos Project. What do we actually share? It's not so easy. There's actually a long uh, history that shows that maybe there's no Judeo-Christian tradition at all. I think many people would say that there is none. Historically, it wasn't a thing. But what we do share is the Hebrew Bible. We share this book this or this set of texts. Uh, and if Jewish Christian Alliance is going to be anything, I think it's going to have to begin with that text. It's this book that transformed Europe from polytheism and disregard for human life to monotheism and, uh, and human dignity. And I would say there would be no West without the Hebraic tradition. Uh, you know, you think about, people will debate this, but you think about, you know, would any self-respecting Westerner today, you know, honor, you know, a Greek custom whereby, uh, you know, babies, unwanted babies would be sort of left to die of exposure because they're not necessarily what we wanted uh, to have. Or the Roman tradition of, you know, gladiatorial combat to the death for the sake of entertainment. Those things are appalling to us and they're only appalling because the Hebraic tradition took over Europe and transformed it from the inside out. Uh, the third point, the West can only be revived by the Hebraic tradition that gave birth to it, and only Jews and Christians together can restore the Hebraic tradition to its place. Now, I would say Christians, you know, we can, it's important that these communities have internal conversations about this, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But Christians by themselves, I would say, cannot revive the Hebraic tradition. We, I think, I speak from personal experience that the Christian church in many ways has been alienated from its own Hebraic origins for 2000 years. We tend to focus largely for some good reason on the new Testament, uh, in a variety of doctrinal distinctives that divide us. You know, we're very, we're very concerned about all of the different sort of dogmas, uh, that divide our different denominations. And in the aftermath of the enlightenment and secularization, Christians in the West, I think are even more at sea about where they come from. In fact, many of the worst aspects of liberalism, the things that we are striving to fight against, are really just sort of watered down, secularized versions of a very New Testament heavy Christianity. And I think it's related to actually what Mike's the point that Mike's making about uh, the Protestant view of the Middle East. At the same time, I think the Jews by themselves also cannot revive the Hebraic tradition. I think the Jews, and this is also provocative, I think Jews in some ways are alienated from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I meet many Christians who know the Bible far better than Jews, and I think Jews in the room will agree with that, uh, some parts anyway. Even if Jews had a complete mastery over the text and were fully immersed in it, they are so small that they have, they have no influence over the many dozens of countries that subsequently adopted the Hebraic tradition. So only these two uh, peoples together, Jews and Christians, this, the people who share this text, can actually do the work of reinvigorating. Now, the role of Israel is really interesting in this regard, I had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were doing a seminar at the Tikva, at the Tikva Fund, and we're, an Israeli was talking. I'm doing all this sort of talking about uh, you know the West and Israel, and he says, you know, excuse me, but we in Israel, we don't necessarily see ourselves as part of the West. You know, when I talk to Israelis, some people may say we're part of the West. Some people say we're not. Some we're some separate thing, or we're part of the Middle East, or whatever it may be. And I was a bit taken aback by that, but then I realized, of course, he was right. And I think that Israel, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily see itself as being part of this conversation. I, and, and I'm speaking broadly, but I think it's there's something true. You know, the whole idea of Am Levadad I mean, it's sort of this idea of a people dwelling apart has really uh, sort of made Jews see themselves as being totally unrelated to Christians. You know, Christians are, you know, especially in Israel, inquisitors or crusaders. There's not a real feeling that we go together. Uh, and of course, Christians see Jews as rejectors of Jesus, people who are sort of maybe in, you know, God's plan still, maybe not. Uh, and there's this feeling where we sort of look at each other and we say, I don't think there's anything here, actually. We're, we're very different. Now, it's what's interesting 
is that people on the outside looking at both of us actually see us as sort of two sides of the same coin. If you think about, of course, you know, Islam, when you, when you read uh, descriptions of Asalabin wal Yahud, the, the Crusaders and the Jews, it's a phrase that just sort of goes together, rolls off the tongue. You see, you know, people like Sayyid Qutub or Osama bin Laden in a famous fatwa in, in 1998 or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in his alternate Christmas message last year in 2015, Crusaders and Jews, Jews and Crusaders, Western imperialists and Zionists, it's the same thing to them. And I think all through you know, Islamic history, Jews and Christians have largely been sort of lumped in the same bucket as Dimi. People who had the truth, sort of screwed it up, and now they're out of, out of the plan and they're walking around with these corrupted, these corrupted texts. But it's not just Muslims. If you go to the West and you think about you know, Western philosophy. If you think about, you know, modern philosophers like Voltaire. Voltaire very much attacked Judaism to get to the root of what he saw was wrong with Christianity and this, you know, this this ideal that it brought into Europe. In Nietzsche, somebody mentioned Nietzsche this morning, who is I'm a huge fan of, even though I disagree with almost everything he says. You know, his idea of, of you know, in his genealogy of morals, when he sort of goes after where this this ascetic ideal comes from, this thing that's really corrupted European culture and, you know, got it off the rails since Rome, he goes back to Judaism and then sees that Judaism being sort of ratcheted up with the advent of Christianity. So while we look at each other and say, I just don't know if there's any sort of cultural connection between us, people on the outside looking in very much see that these guys, yeah, they differ on some things, but there's something essential that they share and we don't like it so much. And I think it's important that we, that we note that. So, My fourth point, Jewish-Christian partnership uh, to revive uh, the West should be focused in a real way on the Middle East as both the site of our common origin, the, 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 the wellspring of our spiritual energy or our transcendent vision, and the site of our greatest interface with another civilization, the Islamic civilization. Now, most talk, as I said at the beginning, most talk about Jewish-Christian alliance in the Middle East is a sort of a, a segue to a, a speech about Christian Zionism. Um, but I think for me, it's, it's very unsatisfactory if we're talking, I mean, it's, that's a different conversation. Jewish Christian Alliance bespeaks something much more. And I think that while Israel has a critical place in this story, the story actually can't start only with Israel and Christian Zionism must be symptomatic of a deeper cultural connection. I think we, we need to think broader and that's why I like the blue sky approach of this conference is it's something we can sort of, uh, propose and then talk about together. I think the time has come to build a real civilizational alliance based around our shared Middle Eastern heritage. We must do it for two reasons. One, like I said, to sort of revive the West by returning to its, its origins, but also in a much more timely way to preserve and protect our Jewish and Christian friends and family who actually are living in the region today. Now, on the first point, as I said, the Middle East is our shared point of origin. It's also in some way sort of our shared destination teleologically in both of our religions, our book, our principles, our basic ideas about how the world, world works all started in the Middle East. Uh, and today it's, 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 well, is the birthplace of the West, it's logically sort of the place of its rebirth as well. But again, the second point, it's, it's today the Middle East is ground zero for a war, a war against the Hebraic idea and the people who share it. Jews and Christians who are facing existential threats in our times, it's a war against human difference and equality, as those ideas are articulated in the Hebrew Bible. It's a fundamentally cultural and spiritual war between essentially uh, uh, you know, a Jehovah culture and an Allah culture. And I think you know, the gods of a culture uh, have something to do with the way those cultures act. I think it's a cultural war between freedom and determinism, between covenant and submission, between pluralism and supremacism, and the idea of limits and the idea of limitlessness. I think that Jews and Christians need each other in the Middle East today in real time. But you may say the numbers don't add up. You know, if I'm the state of Israel and I'm looking around, there's big powers nearby that need to be, you know, dealt with, accommodated uh, and all of that. You know, there are about 6 million Jews in the Middle East, something like 12 to 15 million Christians. You're talking max 20 million of these Hebraic people uh, in the Middle East, that's like 5% of the Middle East. So what could so small a population ever hope to do uh, in this very hostile region? And in general, what can Jews and Christians actually do together? 
Uh, point number five is that Jews and Christians can form, uh, forge concrete alliances that revive their own communities, their nations, uh, and their civilization as a whole. What I'd like to see ultimately, and people often ask me when I talk about these things, like, what are you actually talking about? Like, what, okay, I get the idea, but what is, what's the delivery mechanism? You know, what, are we, what's the, what do we want to see? So what I'd like to see is uh, over a period of time, and this is, by the way, this is the long game. This isn't something that's going to happen within the next you know, administration. Uh, this is, we're talking decades, maybe a century, if we actually started now. Uh, but I'd like to see a vibrant community of Jews and Christians connected between East and West, and then within the East itself, around the spiritual core of the Hebraic tradition, the Hebraic God, and employed in concrete programs designed to educate, strengthen, and do good. So there's sort of two things that I, I want to highlight here. So the first is sort of an educational alliance. And for me, reviving culture necessarily involves education. And this this uh, educational alliance does, it must be designed to dredge up, reform, and rearticulate uh, the common wellsprings of Hebraic thought. I think both communities uh, need to take efforts to educate their own people on their tradition uh, and, and how it affects their cultural life. I can speak as a Christian. This is something that's deeply, deeply lacking in my church. Uh, and of course, that means Christians and Jews need to just actually read the Hebrew Bible, which is a very simple but profound point. Christians and Jews must also be educated to understand that the other community is related to them. You talk to most Christians, Jews are not connected to them. Most Jews, for sure. Christians, that's something else. It's just not relevant. And what, if you believe what I'm saying, these two communities, whether we like it or not, have some sort of shared connection in history. Uh, I think that there needs to be a serious program of scholarship and arts. The point was made, I think, by David about imagination, about Bruce Springsteen. I mean, these are the things that we almost never talk about in the conservative world. And the ideas of Hebraic tradition and alliance, these things are actually maybe best deployed in, in fields such as the arts and the things that speak to people uh, on the, what is it, the right brain. Uh, I think Jews and Christians need to just visit Israel. Israel is their common homeland, and there's something about being in the physical geography of the land that shaped the ideas that animate them that is transformative in a way that I can't really explain, but I think most people here understand. I think also Jews and Christians need to be educated on why the region matters and why it must remain a focal point for their uh, community's lives. So now, nowadays you hear lots of people saying, look, we're becoming more and more energy independent. Middle East is less important. It's really chaotic. There's lots of stuff going on. It's really terrible. Uh, and I think as Jews and Christians, we need to be constantly making the case for why this region matters to us, to our people, and to the world as a whole. Second, in addition to educational initiatives, and I could go into details about different things that I think are important, but is also regional alliance between Jews and Christians in the Middle East. And this is actually something that's more of course, more difficult. So I would say, and this is something I often say to Israeli officials when I meet with them, Israelis should seek to reach out and build bridges, even clandestine ones, between Christian communities in the Middle East. I'm talking about in Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, in Iran. And I think particularly in Lebanon, there's a really tremendous opportunity that, should, that shouldn't be missed. I think it's interesting if you go back and you look in the 1940s, this is before the Lebanese Civil War and the Israeli Maronite connection there, you know, there is a deep bond between uh, the Maronite communities as Christians and the Zionists as Jews. And if you read some of the documentation on that, some of the letters that were written by the patriarchs and the archbishops, uh, it is not some sort of marriage of convenience. There's some deep awareness that we're cousins and we need to defend each other in this land. I think Israel, as much as possible, and I understand Israel has a lot of things going on. This is not going to be at the, the forefront. But I think Israel should commence cultural projects that send a message to the Christian world Christians living in the region, especially, that demonstrate the links between those two communities. And there's abundant opportunities. I can, I can talk about this in the Q&A session, but there's lots of opportunities inside Israel itself. Israel can't control Iraq or Syria or all these places, but there's things inside Israel that Israel can do that will send messages and deepen the bonds between Christians in the region. I can't explain. You know, I do a lot of work on persecuted Christians of the Middle East, in addition to my Israel work. And here I am sitting in Iraq with Assyrian Christians, Assyrian uh, clergy members, and they're like, you know, I know you work uh, with the Jews. Like, can you, you know, can you tell us more about how the Jews did it? How did they sort of secure their community in this region? And can you introduce us to people in Israel? There's a deep uh, hunger behind the scenes. When you talk to people uh, in private, there's a deep uh, interest on the part of many Christians in the Middle East to connect with the Jewish people in the Jewish state. I think there's all kinds of room for communications projects between Jews and Christians, goodwill projects, and bringing them together in some sort of even preliminary 
uh, sort of council or cultural uh, uh, alliance to begin thinking about how to do more. So I think, of course, Israel, if you believe that is Western civilization is the Hebraic idea and that Israel is the birthplace of that, I think the state of Israel, the land of Israel needs to be forefront uh, in all of the work that we do. Not because uh, we agree with every policy of Israel, but because this is sort of where we were born. And I say that as a Christian. Uh, there's other points I wanted to make about Islam. Maybe they can come up uh, in in in, uh, in questions, but I just want to I just want to make one final point, and I'll be done. So this needs to be. I mean, nations. The U.S. policy again can't change the Middle East, and U.S. policy or Israeli policy can't change the Jewish Christian dynamic. This is something that needs to be done by civil society, by scholars, thinkers, nonprofits, students, all of all of the the people who shape culture, artists. Um, and I think that we, uh, we can't rely on this being sort of a government initiative. We need to begin thinking about how to do this as two communities. And it's something that we're not talking about now. And so my proposal is that we start talking about it. And the way that I see it, you know, we, I said we share this common text. This may, I mean, Jews in the room may disagree with this, but the way that I, I think about this is the idea of, uh, of a chavruta. So you have a chavruta, for those in the room, a chavruta is a sort of a, a two students who, stu who sort of pair off to study the Bible together. They have the text in front of them, and one sits on one side, one sits on the other, and they sort of debate over, over what they're saying. They make arguments, they're reading the text, they're, they're making uh, different points, defending themselves, sharpening their arguments. And to me, you know, the idea that we both share a common text and we deeply disagree over what we think that text is saying really, really shows a deeper relationship uh, that reminds me of a chavruta. And I think that, you know, you look at, you know, two people, they're arguing over what the text means, but nobody's disagreeing that the text is fundamentally important. And that while the answers may be elusive, they're somewhere in there. They're somewhere in this shared text. And it's interesting to me that chavruta, actually the root of the word just means friendship. Uh, and I think that's really where this whole thing needs to, uh, to go. An idea of respect, admiration, trust. We're far from that. I think we need to get there. But the idea of friendship is very much uh, something I try to capture in the name of my organization. Philos is Greek uh, for friend. And so as we embark on this sort of program, if we're just doing it on sort of conservative values and Edmund Burke and all of this, I think this should, this should then be just a conservative alliance. And maybe, you know, conservative Muslims should be sitting here in the room. If it's actually a Jewish Christian alliance, we need to think about what is Jewish and Christian about it. And if it is the Hebraic text, and if it is this tradition that we both share, what do we do with it? I think we need to educate ourselves on it. We need to elevate it. We need to reinvigorate it. And I think that uh, uh, time is of the essence. Thank you.